My name is Ben Greenfield, and on this episode of the Ben Greenfield Life Podcast. And I feel fantastic. I'm mean, 47 years old, skin, joints. I mean, I have no pain, no inflammation or anything like that. I, I don't think I'm going ever going to go full carnivore. But it was good for me to kind of eliminate everything else and figure out as I brought back in fruit going, okay, it looks like I'm responding pretty well to fruit. I'm still back and forth. I'm curious where you stand on vegetables because uh, some of the things that I'm hearing that are against vegetables are compelling. But yet I know that 95% of the medical community and science community thinks vegetables are the greatest. Faith, family, fitness, health, performance, nutrition, longevity, ancestral living, biohacking, and a whole lot more. Welcome to the show. Well, howdy, howdy, ho. My apologies if my audio sounds a little funky or different. I happen to be on the road. I've been hunting in Hawaii, but I have have some great, great stuff to get out to you. Uh, first of all, we are working with a new company that makes an amazing kids multivitamin. So if you're looking for something for your kid, but you have realized that most typical children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They got like two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, a bunch of gummy junk that growing kids should never eat is a problem. I'm always looking at these labels for my own kids and you know, in the past I've just fed them liver because I haven't been able to find a good multivitamin. But there's this company called Hiya, H-I-Y-A. It's a pediatrician approved, super powered, chewable multi, right? Most children's vitamins have, again, like five grams of sugar, a couple teaspoons, that contributes to a variety of health issues, paradoxically, but Haya has zero sugar, zero gummy junk, non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, so super safe for any kid who's sensitive to that kind of stuff. They formulated it with the help of a bunch of nutritional experts and physicians. It's a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies. Then they supercharge it with 15 other essential vitamins and minerals like D, B12, C, zinc, folate, so it supports your child's immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, you name it. And the best part is my kids go ape nuts over this stuff. They're going to give all my listeners, whether you have a kid or maybe you just want an amazing multivitamin that tastes great, because I have to admit, I've snuck a few myself. They're going to give us all 50% off. That's pretty big. 50% off. It's your first order. Okay. To claim that, you go to hiahealth.com slash Ben, H I y a health.com slash ben that'll automatically get your kids the full body nourishment that they really need to grow what mattress do i sleep on well i'm picky i'm very picky i wanted a mattress that blocks emf that increases deep sleep cycles based on my actual measurements that actively cools my body even if i can't use one of those fancy bed top cooling thingamajigs accelerates recovery, something my wife likes and I like, something that doesn't off-gas a bunch of chemicals, something that is designed using your health in mind and nothing else, no fancy bells or whistles or Wi-Fi or gadgets or springs or anything, okay? This is like sleeping on the most natural surface imaginable. They've even done what's called dark film microscopy on people's blood cells when they sleep on this mattress and it actually allows your blood cells, your freaking blood cells, to return to a natural free-flowing state. That allows your bloodstream to optimize the oxygen flowing through your body, improves your body's nighttime recovery cycle, improves your sleep quality. Sleep is so important to me. You know that. I'm super picky. I don't just sleep on stuff because people like give it to me. I sleep on stuff because I do the research, and this mattress is top of the top. Essentia, E-S-S-E-N-T-I-A. You go to my Essentia. M-Y-E-S-S-E-N-T-I-A, myessentia.com slash Ben Greenfield. Use code Ben VIP. That'll get you an additional $100 off your Essentia mattress. So myessentia.com slash Ben Greenfield and use code Ben VIP. Are you ready to get a golden milk latte without spending eight bucks at the local coffee shop? There's this stuff. It's this gold latte pre-mixed blend, delicious and filled with superfoods and medicinal mushrooms. It is one of the best nighttime tonics. Keeps your mind off of ice cream and other sweets at night. 
kind of heals your body while you sleep. I shouldn't say heals. I don't even know if I can say that. Heals, cures, all I, I, all I know is it makes you feel amazing because it promotes restful sleep and supports physical recovery. You wake up refreshed without drowsiness, tastes delicious and like a little bit of warm coconut milk. Oh, so good. Low sugar, so it's a dessert-like tea that's guilt-free, 100% USDA certified organic. It's called Organifi Gold. Organifi makes these amazing juice powders. Organifi Gold is turmeric, and ginger, and reishi mushroom, and oh, it's all blended together and tastes so, so good. They've got lemon balls in there and turkey tail as well, which are super nourishing to your gut and your immune system. You get 20% off of this stuff. You go to Organifi.com slash Ben. That's Organifi with an I.com slash Ben, and that will get you 20% off your order from Organifi. And that's the gold juice powder I just told you about. All right, folks. So last year, even though I don't watch that much TV, barely any TV at all, my sons convinced me to sit down with them and watch this TV series that they seemed kind of addicted to at the moment. It was it was called The Chosen. I actually watched nearly the entire first season of this show with them. And it's basically the story of Jesus and Jesus' disciples, but it's, it's told in this really, really compelling and entertaining manner, like just getting into, into how Jesus reaches out to people with all of his miracles and his ministry through the world. But it's funny and it's humorous and it's joyful and it's personable. And I, I kind of enjoyed it so much, I wound up talking with a few friends about it. And one of my friends mentioned to me that he actually knew the creator of the project, a guy named Dallas Jenkins. And it turns out that Dallas is actually, in addition to uh, being the man behind this series, The Chosen, into fitness and recovery and the mind-body connection and biohacking. And so after a few brief exchanges on, on text messages and email, I decided that it would be really interesting to get Dallas on the show and kind of hear a little bit about how a guy like him in the filmmaking industry is taking care of himself and, and a lot of the things he's learned along the way in terms of life hacking and biohacking. And uh, he just seemed like a really interesting guy. Now, the other thing that you might find interesting about him is if you're a Christian or have been associated or, or interested in the Christian entertainment industry for any amount of time, Dallas is the son of the guy who wrote the Left Behind series, author Jerry Jenkins. And um, Dallas produced his first uh, independent feature called Hometown Legend when he was 25, and that got distributed by Warner Brothers. And since then, for the past 20 years, he has produced uh, dozens of feature and short films for companies like Universal and Lionsgate and Hallmark Channel and Amazon. And this this latest project, The Chosen, which you should check out, by the way, like even you might not be a Christian if you're listening in, but I honestly think that it's, it's just a really, really great show either way. Whether or not you're interested in Jesus, you you probably will be after you watch it. It's actually the largest crowdfunded media project of all time and is now a multi-season series, even though uh, Dallas don't kill me, but I have yet to even get into ser- to, uh, to season two just because I watch TV so infrequently. But man, the, the, the first season was, was really good and it's, it's going to be fun to have you on the show, man. Oh, I'm so thrilled. I'm, I, uh, I got really nerdy when, when uh, our mutual friend David uh, told me you like the show and he's, he's like, you guys should talk. And I am so, I, I got t- totally into your podcast. I've got your, uh, your, your sleeping pills or whatever you call it. <laughs> Kyan thing. We'll talk about that at some point. Cause I have some questions about it, but I mean, yeah, it has been, uh, uh it's just been so fun. So yeah, this is like a dream. My wife is, is teasing me about coming on the show. It's all, it's always fun to interview a podcast guest who may or may not have an NAD suppository up their butt. So <laughs> yeah. We don't have to go there, though. Uh, so, ac- actually, I, I am curious, though, just just so I can kind of get a little bit of a flavor of the type of stuff you get up to. Uh, we're doing this interview like mid morning my time. You're down in Texas, so probably closer to noon your time. Uh, w- w- what's a typical kind of morning look like for you, if there is a typical morning, as far as the type of of must dos or or real non negotiables for you, particularly in, in kind of like the health morning routine type of a uh, sector. Yeah, so my my days change quite frequently, but uh, you you asked a good question, which is what are my non negotiables? So when I'm filming, which is the most insane of my life, that's wh- that's where you know eighty days, uh, you know five days a week over the course of multiple months, uh, you know I'm doing fourteen hour days, uh, most of which is spent on the set, and so some of those days start at six in the morning, some of them start at four in the afternoon. 
I'm a night guy. I'm a I'm a night owl. I most of my writing and and editing and stuff is done, you know, 11 to 4 in the morning. I'm a big oh, wow. Yeah, I'm a big night owl, but sometimes I can't afford to be. So no matter what, every morning when I wake up, uh, first thing I do is I'll usually drink something, whether it's, uh, you know, I have like a, um, cause I'm, I'm kind of keto ish, carnivore ish. I'm okay. right. In the, I'm in the, actually, as we talk, I'm in the middle of a, of a transition, but, uh, I, I always start my morning with some sort of drink of, you know, some apple cider vinegar and some lemon juice and salt and, and cream of tartar for potassium and whatnot, mm-hmm. usually some sort of mix. And then I get in my cold tank. So I've got a renu cold tank. R E N U is the name of their company and they're great. R E N U. Yeah. Okay. They're pronounced Renu. And they uh, I did a lot of research on cold tanks and uh, theirs is, seems to be the, the, the best combination of uh, practicality and ease of use, but also working really well. I mean, they're, they're, their chiller is really great. You can set the temperature, whatever you want. Um, some people just would prefer, you know, a bucket and they just pour ice in it. But um, because I'm in a rush, usually it's it's better. So I, I, every morning I get in for about 45 seconds, completely submerged. 45 seconds. But you, you must keep it pretty cold to just go 45 seconds. Holy cow. I just pulled up a picture of it. Wow. Siberian cold plunge. Do you have this large tank, the big one? Yeah. Wow. That's really nice. That's, a, it's a, that's like a, a, almost a $14,000 cold plunge. That looks pretty pretty sexy. Yeah, it's, it is. Uh, it's a nice one. Um, so yeah, I saved up because when I moved to Texas, I don't get cold enough water for showers. Like yeah. the, cold, the water isn't cold enough. So I always took cold showers, but you know, and I had a friend who had a really awesome cold plunge that he built himself. And I used to go to his place once a week or so. So eventually I saved up, nested in this cold plunge and it's been fantastic. Now, uh, yeah, for 45 seconds, I just hold my breath. I do some breathing before I get in. So I do about 20 them off, uh, inhale, exhales, and then I hold my breath for about 45 seconds, completely submerged. So that's every morning. At night, usually a few times a week, I'll get in up to my neck for about six, seven minutes. Mm-hmm. I keep it at 45. A lot of athletic recommendations are in the 50s, but I prefer it colder. Um, I just tend to be a little bit more of an extreme, extreme guy. So I do 45. My whole family does it now, actually, as well. I have multiple kids who have various uh, health issues. I have one daughter who has Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is really hard on the joints and yeah. skin and whatnot. So she, when she's not at college, she's doing the cold tank. So yeah, I've got, I've got multiple reasons for it, but every morning, no matter what, first thing, 45 seconds, totally submerged head underwater. Uh, then on shooting days, I don't have time for a full workout. So I do about eight to 10 minutes with a, like a heavy kettlebell. I'll do like 50, 75 swings while I'm standing on a, mm-hmm. a vibrating, one of those kind of, you stand on it and it vibrates your legs and stuff like that. It's just, Oh, you moving. do the swings while you're on the vibration platform. Yeah. Yeah. That's one exercise I actually haven't done on the vibration platform. Like my go- I have one of those big power plate platforms and my go-to workout is I do a minute long isometric squat, then a minute of push up. So this, this would be like when I have serious decision-making fatigue and all I want to do is just a super simple workout. So a minute, a minute squat hold to a minute push ups, and I'll just jam back and forth for 10 rounds for so a total of 20 minute workouts, but I haven't thrown the swings in. Yeah. So I'll just do anywhere from 50 to 75 swings. And I'll just, while I'm standing on that, the other thing that's a non-negotiable for me, and I learned this from Athlean X, you know, Jeff uh, Cavalier, uh, he said, you know, do this every day. And this has been a game changer for me because I had lower back pain for 20 years. And this has mm-hmm. been, I think, the top things also for my kids because my kids are all, you know, on their phones. I mean, I think everyone needs to do this exercise, which is I just take a stretch band and I hold it above my head. So if you can okay. picture this, you know, my, my palms facing me. And I, and, you know, it's almost like you're doing a chin up. So I put my palms above my head and, I, and and they face me and I put my thumbs out and I hold the stretch band and I pull it down to my chest and with, with the hands out. So it's like a, you know, it's like I'm doing oh, yeah. snow, snow angels to my chest. Yeah. It's almost like a band pull apart, but you're moving it down yes. towards your chest as you're pulling it apart. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. That, that, that's something that, um, I don't know if you looked into Ben Patrick much, uh, the, the, he's known as a knees over toes guy, but he also has a really great book on Amazon, tiny little book, but it's called the, the, the ATG ATG for life. There's two workouts in there. You just do one, you know, one, one day of the week and one another day of the week. And they're all these really simple injury prevention workouts, like split squat lunges and low back extensions and some variations on the tib anterior exercise. But he has those band pull aparts because it trains all those muscles that tend to get pulled forward as you work on your computer or as you're driving. But I, I hadn't tried bringing the, the, so you're starting over your head and then bring it down to the chest as you pull the band apart. Yes. And uh, I don't remember the the science behind it. I just know that it's been working for me, but I think it's about 
it, it works some muscles that you don't get just from traditional face pulls um, and yeah. other banded parts. This huh. is, and here's the, the, the main thing. I think also because I know Jeff Cavalier is big on shoulders, like shoulder injuries. I've had uh, shoulder surgery. Uh, I used to, I, I dislocated my shoulder multiple times uh, until I finally had surgery. My, it's, it runs on my family. So a lot of the stuff I do is really to help my shoulders. So one of the reasons why I don't do a lot of push-ups because mm-hmm. they tend to be harder. But anyway, I do 12 to 15 of those every single morning. I also do those on the the vibration machine uh, just for no other reason than just it's, you know, I'm, I'm in a rush. So I want to get yeah. <laughs> as, as much little helps as I can get. Well, that, what that does is it, it works the muscle memory for posture. Like it really, like the moment you're done doing those, your, your chest is up, your shoulders are back. You mean the and, band, the band pole parts? Yes. Okay. And I get comments now I used to slouch uh, and I get comments now from people who didn't even know that I used to slouch. who will just say, well, you really have good posture. Like what is behind that? You know, I'm like band poles, you know, the, up, <laughs> and uh, but, but today it's even more power, uh, important than ever with all the, how people are on their phones and slouched over and neck down and everything. And I'm pretty obsessed with my kids about putting their chin up while they're on their phone. Um, but this, this exercise uh, is again, a non-negotiable. So whether I have time or I don't, I do the, 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 the band pull every, every morning. And then the other, only other one that's non-negotiable is foam rolling my glutes. That's another thing that has changed the game for my lower back. I mean, it has been, I used to foam roll really? my lower back. Uh, yeah, I used to foam roll my lower back because it hurt so good. I felt like I was doing something for years. And I then saw this video online that was like, do not foam roll your lower back. Your curve, your spine is already curved in that direction. Mm-hmm. And you're making it worse, you know, yada, yada. So now I foam roll my glutes and I, I actually line up the foam roller perpendicular to my leg. Not, uh, no, sorry, parallel to my parallel leg. Parallel to your leg, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I foam roll my glutes every morning without exception. And that has more than any other thing, including um, some other things that I do for my back that are great too, like uh, you know luggage carry and all that. But the the foam rolling my lower back, or sorry, foam rolling my glutes every morning um, has just completely changed the game. And now I stay on, like I'm on my feet, you know, literally 12, 14 hours a day without yeah. a single issue. And that's been a big game changer for me. Yeah. So when you so when you see your foam on the glutes and it's parallel, so it's lined up along the same axis as your leg, like like going down towards your quad. And are you are you kind of like shearing back and forth that way? So what I do when I foam roll, and, and this is again another Jeff Cavalier tip, is instead of just rolling back and forth, I'm doing little pulses, like kind of you know just like back yeah. and forth you know, five seconds at a time. Yeah, almost like flossing, like Kelly Starrett would call it. Exactly. And then I slowly move it across from one side of the cheek to the other, Hmm. and you know, towards the crack, and then I go to the other cheek, and then I do that. And so it's, you know, 15, well, no, it's probably longer than that, probably 30 to 45 seconds per cheek. Yeah. And I'm telling you, man, that is a absolute game changer. And everyone that I have recommended that to, because on, on movie sets, I'm running into people who are always stretching their back and they're always like, oh, my molar back's killing me. I'm like, dude, I, I'll buy them a foam roller. I send them a video that I once posted on my my Instagram page. Of yeah. Like, These are four things that changed my life with my back. And, uh, and I send it to them and all of them come back and go, oh my gosh, instant relief, total change. I mean, it's just, I don't know what, I think it kind of like almost releases the tension that's existing yeah. in your Back. but man between that and the and the upper body sorry upper back kind of band pulls so you, you said there were four things the, the band pull parts the the rolling the the glutes parallel what were the other two do you remember the other two things for my that, that have changed my lower back are the the luggage carry you know the farmer's carry whatever you call it is uh walking on the treadmill you know just holding heavy weights at my side you know I just saw that that was one of the most common exercises that was in every popular fitness routine. And uh, so that really just worked the core. And then I also do it on uh, one hand at a time too. So I'll do, I'll, I'll carry like maybe 70 or 80 pounds in both hands and, you know, do that for let's say a minute. And then I'll also then do like 60 pounds in one hand for a minute or a minute and a half or two minutes, switch to the other side. That really works the, uh, the lats. Like when you're holding a heavy weight on, on, just at your side without even moving you're just holding it touch the other side the opposite lat and it's just totally <laughs> like ripping and engaged so i lift weights heavy heavy weights three days a week and on the off days i walk on the treadmill yeah you you walk you walk on the treadmill but you, but you hold the dumbbells while you're doing it yeah not the whole time i mean yeah. I'll, I'll, i mean i'll do a treadmill walk for about 45 minutes now the other thing that this is the fourth thing is from knees over toes guy which is walking backwards yeah so 
walking backwards on the treadmill for 15 minutes. I usually do that in, in you know, early on or, or near the end of that workout. I'm usually wearing a weighted vest. I got a 60 pound weighted vest that I wear. Um, but so I'll do 45 minutes on the treadmill. This is, this is again, when I'm filming, I don't have time for this. When I'm filming, I get in about 15,000 steps a day, just naturally. I'm not, I don't need to, to be on a treadmill, Yeah. but yeah. day like today where I'm not filming anymore, um, I get up, I do a normal workout, you know, 45 minutes or so, and I'm lifting weights one day. And then the off day, quote unquote, I'm on a treadmill wearing a weighted vest and I'm doing the farmer carry for some of it. I'm walking backwards for 10 to 15 minutes, but all that core work is been the biggest thing when it comes to long-term back relief. And then you, you preach this more than anybody. You can just take a pill to make it feel better. You've got to over time recreate your system so that it's foundationally stronger for things like your back. And so yeah. Yeah, the core work and the, the, the footwork, I mean, Ichiru Suzuki was, you know, a Japanese baseball player who played in the major leagues and lasted until he was like 46. Yeah, and they talked to him about the secret of his fitness and his success and his longevity. He's like feet. I take care of my feet. Yeah. So I've got a slant board. I've got, uh, you know, I walk backwards when I'm on the treadmill, I wear flat soled shoes, like those, you know, running shoes that have no. Yeah. Like, like the minimalist zero, zero drop. Yeah. yeah zero drop. Yeah. It's funny you say that. Cause like right now, as you're talking about foot care, I, I have this, uh, this one company, Naboso, they sell like proprioceptive foot mats. I got one in my sauna and then they have like the little toast blade devices and socks that have the, the proprioceptive material built into it. But then they have, you know, things you can stand on while you're at your desk. And I have one of their little balls underneath my feet right now. I have that in one of these, these topple mats. So I'm constantly doing footwork while I'm podcasting with a guy like you. So I get it. The, the um, yeah, the, they're a uh, Naboso, Emily, Emily Splichal, S P L I C H A L. She's like the go-to person, the go-to doctor for foot optimization. She was on my podcast a while ago, but their products are super cool for anybody who's just like standing around their desk anyways and, and wants to do the foot care. Are you an advocate for avoiding like cushions and stuff? Because I used to wear foot lifts and cushions yeah. and thick old shoes and I've, I've started to come off of that. Yeah, it, it kind of depends. Like like let, let's say your, your goal is just the biomechanical aspects of like – hip and knee alignment and getting stronger feet and avoiding the compressed toe box phenomenon that a lot of times, you know, wind up reshaping people's feet and leading to the, to the upper biomechanical issues. And yeah, like I'm, I'm a fan of the minimalist approach, but I think there's also practical aspects. Like, you know, when I raced Spartan, I tried to go minimalist for a while, but the problem is, you know, you're on rocks and, you, and you're going over berries and you'd constantly be injuring your feet because these minimalist shoes didn't provide quite enough cushion. So I went kind of like mid cushion for those while still wearing for my day to day footwear for my long walks, you know, things like the earth runner sandals or V brooms or other minimalist footwear. You know, another example would be like hunting. You know, if I go hunting in Hawaii and I'm on lava rocks or if I'm, you know, traipsing around the snow out here in Washington, yeah, I'm not gonna be an idiot and wear like, you know, the the old Tom Mahara sandals or you you probably call them Jesus sandals, I guess, uh, in, in your sector. But you know, I'm kind of picky choosy, but then the other thing is like a lot of people nowadays, they have like, uh, like gout, you know, uric acid deposits in the toes. Uh, they'll get like foot injuries or plantar fasciitis, et cetera. And for somebody like that, to wear minimalist shoes, like torture. Now, I, I had a, a foot injury a few months ago and I actually, for the first time in my life, bought one of the shoes I would have made fun of like two years ago, these big cushion, like cloud running hokas. And oh my gosh, they're so comfortable. Like I, I could walk for miles and miles and miles and I even think about my feet or foot pain or foot discomfort at all. And I, and I realized, yeah, maybe if I were to use those all the time, I'd be getting weak feet. But I, I think for the rest of my life, I will have one pair of these big built up, super comfortable Cadillac like cushion shoes, just because they do make long walks super comfortable or like a day of travel where you're walking through airports, things like that. I, I, I do like the idea of throwing in the big old cushion ones every once in a while. And kind of for me, it's probably 80, 20. I'm like 80% minimalist, get the feet stronger, do the foot therapy with the ball, wear the, the earth runner type of sandals or the Vibram type of soles or, or the, uh, what's the other company Vivo barefoot, but then 
for long, long walks or times when my feet are just beat up, I'll do the hokas. And then the other one is, is I've been getting super into pickleball. And so for a lot of those type of sports, you know, minimalist just doesn't work. You know, they, they just don't have enough toe protection, et cetera. But, but yeah, that's, that's my take on, on the, on the foot care stuff. You, you did mention a couple things I wanted to, uh, to dive into briefly. Cause I, I had a few thoughts that went through my head. I didn't want to interrupt you as you're going through your routine, but you talked about the backward walking on the treadmill, which I, I have this philosophy that when I go for a walk back to that 80, 20 approach, I try to walk backwards for 20% of the time. I'll get texts from people near my house who see me walking up the road. They're like, Hey, I saw you walking backwards up by your house the other day. And, and it's because I will always throw in and it's just like, you know, sometimes for every mile I walk, I'll throw in a hundred steps walking backwards. But I think that whole idea of it being the Chinese secret to longevity or, you know, as, as Ben Patrick, the knees over toes guy says, you know, one of the best things you can do for your knee musculature. I think there's something to that, but I was recently looking and I realized this might not be up everybody's alley, but since Dallas, you, you spent $13,000 on a cold plunge you might be interested in this this new treadmill called a sled mill have you seen this thing i haven't although i mean i've seen i've seen ben do on his videos the the sled poles and stuff yeah th this is like a treadmill because like i i live on a north facing slope out in the trees <clears throat> i got a long driveway but it's all gravelly like i don't have a lot of places i can do sled pushing and sled pulling but this is like a treadmill you, you should google it. it's called the sled mill and it's it's designed for people who want to do like some of those really rigorous sled pushes sled pulls backwards walking etc but it's uh it's, it's all just on a treadmill so you don't actually have to you know be be covering 100 yards or whatever so that that's an interesting device i haven't gotten one yet but i'm i'm it's probably the next kind of like purchase i'm gonna do for my home gym it's called a sled mill and that one's interesting but then the other thing you were talking about the um the farmer's walks i had a, a coach i've interviewed him on the on the show before he's my kettlebell coach uh, uh joseph i knew and he introduced me to the concept of death walks and th this is this is like a game changer when it comes to taking the idea of luggage carries on the treadmill, activating the lats, and kind of keeping the shoulder complex in place. If you if you have good, nice, upright posture, it's like that on steroids. What you do is you do that same type of long walk, but you do it with two kettlebells, and you start with the kettlebells overhead, like literally both of them overhead, shoulders locked, as good a posture as you can maintain. And then once your shoulders kind of poop out. Then you move them down into a racked position on the chest. And then once you get to the position where you can't hold the rack position anymore, then you drop them and you go into the standard farmer's walk. And I started doing that instead of just the standard farmer's walk. And I mean, the, the idea of the full body workout, kind of the inspiratory and expiratory muscle training when you got them racked right at your chest. And then the final component, just doing the luggage carries until your grip is gone. It's kind of like, like an upgrade to the idea of doing just the luggage carry. So it's a death walk with a kettlebell starting overhead and then rack position and then down by the side. And I, I, I like that one even better than the luggage carries now. So if you have a couple of kettlebells, you just try that one out. You get on a treadmill or you could do it you know, in your, in your yard or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking it up while you're talking and, and yeah, that's a dumbbell death march is what it's, what it, what, Oh, is what that it what they call it? Yeah. I, I've, I've only ever done it with kettlebells. I have no dumbbells, but you could obviously, you, you could pull off with dumbbells too, or, or, uh, or, uh, sandbags. You know, the other thing I was going to ask you was you mentioned that Instagram video that you shared with the band pull aparts and the foam rolling and the backwards walking and the, uh, what was the last one? It was the the, the luggage carry. Yeah. Oh, the luggage carry. Yeah. If you have that video and you want to email it to me or text it to me, I'll put it in the show notes. If, if people want to go check it out, it's going to be at bengreenfieldlife.com slash Dallas, D-A-L-L-A-S. Cause I know for some people who are visual, they'll, they'll probably want to see this. So can you shoot me that video? Absolutely. I've shared it with a lot of people and I, I'm, I've, uh, my uh, social media pages are primarily for film, of course, but I started yeah. once a week just doing little tips, you know, and I'm getting people now when, when they recognize me will come up and go, oh, I'm loving your, you know, health tips. I just, you know, started eating egg yolks instead of <laughs> whites, and you know, it's so much better. I'm trying, and uh, it's like so gratifying. So the, awesome. yeah, the, the back thing was, was huge. So yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, Okay. That. So if things don't work out in the film industry, you can be an, an online Instagram influencer for fitness. There you go. I was going to ask you one other thing too. Uh, and, and then I want to hear a little bit more about your diet, your, your late night work and this idea of, you know, working from 11 PM to 4 AM or whatever. Obviously I, I can tell by the way you're talking, you're no doubt aware of like the, the elements of circadian rhythmicity and, and how, how hard shift work can be on the body and things like that. But do you have, have certain hacks, whether it's nootropics or smart drugs or like light producing devices or things that you use to kind of get you through a sleep deprived day or a lot of that late night work? Yeah. 
here's the thing. I, I wish I had better advice on this, but I think a lot of this for me is genetics. I, I just have always been a night owl. Uh, I don't need quite as much sleep as the average person. Some people have told me it's because of how I eat. You know, when I when I, I was keto for about five years, now I'm transitioning a little bit more towards uh, into the Paul Saladino realm mm-hmm. of things. I'm introducing more fruits and whatnot. And, and I think the cold plunge <laughs> makes a difference for me. So I do have occasionally... I have a, I do have those. Um, I don't, I don't remember the name of it. I wish I could, but there's like a device you you wear on your eyes. Um, it's like it's like goggles. But oh, the uh, the retimer glasses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, I have a set of those. They're amazing. They do a, uh, they they produce the greenish blue wave light, which is the one that's closest to the the wakefulness spectrum of sunlight. They they work actually really well. Like if you combine those with the, uh, have you seen the in ear one that they make in Finland, the human charger. Oh, I haven't seen that now. Okay, so yeah. the human charger does the ears, and then the retimers do the eyes, and that's what I'll use when I travel. I'll just do that one-two combo if I'm in some place where, I don't know, like Vegas or whatever, where it's almost impossible to go find sunlight in the morning. I'll put those on and for, for jump-starting the circadian rhythm or keeping you up if you got to work late at night. That, that's a really good one-two combo. Yeah. So the 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 light stuff, I, yeah, I haven't heard about the ears. That's interesting. I'll look into that. But the, the putting the thing on my eyes, usually... I don't do it at night, but I'll do it midday. Like if I wake up at 10, uh, like let's say I'm in a real intense writing session for a couple of weeks where my hours are, like my wake hours are from like 10 or 11 in the morning till, you know, three or four at night. I might do it, you know, in the afternoon just to kind of, just to kind of shift the hours a little bit. But, I, but a lot of the thing is sunlight. I mean, I, I used to be a total vampire. My wife used to tease me about it. I mean, I, I didn't like sunlight. I, I always had the shades down. I just preferred it. Um, didn't hated the heat. I, you know, I, and now I'm moved to Texas, so I still hate the heat, but I, I, I've been forced to get used to it. But I'm just really embracing sunlight now more than ever. Uh, when COVID hit and I just, every single, um, you know, bit of research I was doing, because I was just obsessed with, our country fighting COVID differently from just uh, just trying to take, I mean, I, I, I'm not against vaccines or anything, but I was just like, I think our country as a whole needs to be better prepared f- but with our bodies to handle viruses than just solely, uh, you know, trying right. to cover it with other stuff. But so I was just looking into all that and it just seems like across the world, throughout the history of time, all the way up until today, every smart person <laughs> says sunlight is the cure to like half of our issues. So I've just decided to embrace that more. So when I wake up, even if I'm waking up at 10 or 11 in the morning, I'm, when I go out to my cold plunge, I'm going outside, I'll walk around for a few minutes, stare, you know, into the, not at the sun, but in the direction of the sun. Um, and then I'll do that again, you know, maybe in the afternoon, just to try to, to really tell my body we're, we're awake, we're vibrant. So even if it's, I'm doing that at four o'clock in the afternoon instead of someone like you who might be doing it at nine in the morning. I'm trying to just trigger my body to be on a on a normal cycle, but just at a different time. Right. You're you're shifting your circadian rhythm forward. Right. Yeah. I wonder have have you ever done any gene testing? Because those, those the sleep genes. I, I think it's the uh, the the DEC two gene was the original one, and then they found a, a couple other mutations that allowed the few people who actually are telling the truth that they actually do get by in short sleep. Cause you know, there's a certain people who say, Oh, I'll sleep and I die. And they technically are horribly unhealthy and they can't get by in short sleep. Then there's certain people that actually go through their full sleep cycles in a shorter period of time. And they, they have these gene mutations that alter the neurotransmitters in the, in the human brain that allow for shorter sleep cycles. It probably the same type of people who, I, I don't know, in the ancestral times would have been wired up to be like the sentries or the people, you know, guarding the cities at night or whatever. You, you you can actually have this short sleep gene and live healthy with it. I don't know if you've ever tested your genes for this, but I I I got to ask you. I've talked to a few people who actually have done like the twenty three and Me or the full genetic analysis and found these these sleep genes. I'll, I'll link to an article in the show notes if anybody wants to read up on them. But these people have reported me that they also tend to have super crazy dreams, like like sometimes almost like nightmarish dreams. But every night they seem to have intense dreams. Have you ever found that to be the case for you? What's funny is the time that I have the most intense dreams and my sleep cycle is the shortest is when I took, when I usually take certain types of sleeping aids. And the biggest one, I told you this, when I took your, how do you pronounce it again? Is it Kion or Kion? Oh, the Kion sleep with the, with the uh, tryptophan. Yeah. So I, I got your Kion sleep after I listened to one of your podcasts, because when I'm filming, sometimes I'm up late, but I still have to get up early in the morning. So anyway, and I don't want to fall asleep fast. Well, when I took your Kion sleep, I had super intense dreams and I woke up 
I think it was four or four and a half hours into, you know, like just woke up like I was awake right. and uh, I didn't feel exhausted. And I, that's why I was texting him like, how do I get back to sleep if I'm waking up at, you know, four in the morning, but I don't want to wake up at four in the morning. Yeah. So I think now I use your pills on nights when I've stayed up too late and I, but I still have to get up early and I need four and a half, you know, cause I try to time it according to 90 minute intervals, you know, 90 minutes, three hours, four and a half, six, seven and a half. Those, I, I, I've, that, that seems to be a good, good pattern, but uh, I'll, I'll get like, if I want short, but good sleep, uh, your pills uh, worked, but yeah, yeah I, I haven't done any uh, testing. I'm, I'm actually going to be doing 23 and me here on a couple of days. I was, I, I just ordered the kit. What's funny is my dad's the opposite. My dad gets up and does all his writing from like 5.30 in the morning till 11 in the morning. But I've always just been a night owl. Now, to be fair, I don't want to be uh, – I still try to get six hours of sleep. That's my – like if I can get six, that's ideal for me. If I can get more, that's great too. But I've just found that even when I get a short amount of sleep and I have a full day of 14 hours on the set, I just don't find the things that other people talk about, brain fog. Um, yeah. It's crash in the afternoon or anything like that. Like my mood doesn't seem to be affected by it. You know, the cold plunge has has, has ensured that even more. I feel even more alive um, shortly after I wake up. But I'm telling you, I I don't feel a lot of the things that other people talk about. My workouts, I don't sense. Like if I've worked out after having a not a great night's sleep, it doesn't seem to impact. Like I don't feel like I'm, and I don't sense that I'm lifting. I have to lower my weights or anything like that. It's just a unique thing. So yeah, you you probably do have one of those genes. Although I don't I don't know if the twenty three and me sometimes they don't report on those genes. You know there there are there are places you can export those results out to like a genetic genie for example. They give you a more full analysis of your genes. You know the the one I tend to use a lot that do, again doesn't give the sleep genes but will tell you all of the variants that are the ones that are most significant in terms of susceptibilities to specific health issues is Stratagene. And you can do your 23andMe test like you're going to do and then export the results into Stratagene. And that's what I have a lot of my clients do because it identifies the major genes that you actually have to worry about, right? Because 23andMe will tell you some stuff that's, you know, I'm not that important, like your propensity towards blue or brown eyes or, you know, whether or not you're going to lose your your hair or something like that. But then Stratagene will give you like your nitric oxide synthase genes, your, your methylation genes your glutathione profile, a lot of stuff that is a little bit more actionable in terms of data. Another thing that I thought of when you were mentioning the uh, the key on sleep and how it, it actually does help you get back to sleep if you wake up during in the, in the night and you got to take it whatever, like 3 a.m., but you don't want to wake up at 5 a.m. groggy, uh, which you would, would happen if you took like melatonin or, or CBD or something like that. Uh, what I do with the key on sleep is I either use the powder, which gets absorbed a lot more quickly if you just let it dissolve in your mouth, or else I'll actually chew on the capsules. They don't taste that great, but you get it into your system a lot more quickly. But what I do now, uh, since you texted me, this is like a new thing that that I've been trying and it works really well, is a non-sleep deep rest protocol after you dose. Like let's say I wake up at 2.30 because I had to get up to pee and I'm having a hard time getting back to sleep. I'll do the key on sleep, but the non-sleep deep rest protocol is basically like a body scan where you start at your feet, awareness into the feet, then let the feet relax and then move up to the calves, move up to the knees and the quads and the hips and the low back and so on and so forth, all the way up to you know the arms. And then finally, if you're still awake at that point, the neck, the back of the head, and then the face and the top of the head. And what, what inevitably happens to me is like by about the time I get up to my torso, I just lose track of time. And then I wake up a couple hours later, the guy who has made that protocol popular actually has a, a YouTube video where he walks you through it. Although you can download they're they're called NSDR protocols. Uh, they're also known, uh, from a more ancestral standpoint as, as yoga nidra protocols, but essentially it's like a body scan. There's something about it though. And I think it's because it keeps your mind from thinking about other things like ruminating thoughts, such as what you're going to do when you wake up later on to work is it allows you to focus on just these body parts. You almost get bored doing it very similar to counting sheep, but more effective. And meant that, that one, two combo of doing NSDR or yoga nidra plus the key on sleep has been really, really good for me for those like early morning awakenings where I really know it's, it's not quite time to get out of bed. Yeah, that's really good. Um, you know, do do you find that? Because I, I find that it, that it, when I have to get up early uh, for a specific thing, that's the worst. Because yeah. I 
even if I get to bed at a normal hour, I wake up at three, I wake up at four, I wake up yep. looking at the alarm clock. I you mean like see. when you have a plane flight or an important phone call that's early in the morning? Yeah. Yeah. I can't figure out how to trick my brain into not stressing about it, you know, while I'm actually sleeping. Now, the things that have helped me the best with sleeping, because I had sleep issues for years and years and years. I mean, meaning I, like, as I said, I, I feel like I don't need as much sleep as the average person. And yet I know that's not ideal. I, st- I know you, 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 just because I can function doesn't mean it's healthy for me. So, but I would have troubles just falling asleep at night. I have ADHD. I just, you know, my brain was always firing on all cylinders, but a weighted blanket has been a big difference maker for me because it keeps me from moving around so much yeah. while I'm sleeping. Uh, chili pad really, uh, I think helped, you know, keeping me cool because I get really hot at night. So the chili pad was a big uh, game changer for me. And then uh, the cold tank, if I do it too close to bedtime, then that seems to be difficult. But if I yeah. do it, maybe 30 minutes before or 45 minutes before bedtime. Oh man, uh, it's like a sleeping pill. Yeah, the cold tank's interesting because if you do the super cold or a super cold shower right before you go to bed or in the couple hours before you go to bed, it's kind of similar to a hard workout. You get this adrenaline epinephrine response that paradoxically keeps you from going to sleep despite your core temperature being lower. So the trick for the night is you kind of go like, lukewarm or slightly cold or very, very brief for the cold exposure, just enough to get the body's core temp down. And if you already have the chili pad, then, you know, you, you really don't need to go much longer than that. But have you, have you, you said you used a gravity blanket. Have you seen that, that chili pad? Although I think they changed their name to, to sleep me now, the company, they do a weighted blanket that you can get that attaches to a chili pad device that actually circulates cold water or warm water. If you want it through the gravity blanket. Oh no, I haven't seen that. Yeah, it's super cool. I use it in the winter because because the gravity blanket just you know it, it's kind of like if you were a kid swaddled up in in clothing. You know, it's got this this soothing effect. But man, with the cold water going through it, you you basically got the cold underneath you and on top of you at that point. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm taking more notes during this conversation than I'm, gonna I'm probably going to cost you a few dollars now and now between that and the, and the, and the sled mill and the extra kettlebells. The other thing kind of related to stressing when you have to get up, it's really interesting because you, you hear a lot about that with medical students who will have to like, you know, sleep during their, their residency or whatever, but know that at any point and, and physicians too, that they got to be on call and get up. There's this weird, uh, shift that takes place in the human brain where when you know that you're going to have to wake up or you, or you don't even know when you're going to have to wake up, but you know, it's going to happen. The body doesn't sleep that well. The same as when you're going to catch a plane flight or when you, when you have an early morning appointment, that's why like I, I personally, even though I'm highly productive in the mornings, I try to as much as possible avoid any actual appointments until about 9 30 or 10 a.m and everything else all, all the work up to that point is on my own time just because i i have the same thing if i know there's something coming up early in the morning it's it's strange it's actually much much harder to actually get to sleep it's brutal i mean yeah and i i haven't i have not figured out how to do that like the the night before you know the first day of the week in fact i have a few other crew members who say the same so sunday night we know that the first day of the week is coming we've had a weekend we've been rested and uh you know first day of a filming week is usually very early in the morning because well it's a long story why but you're, you're usually because of union rules you know you have to give what's called turnaround at the end of each day meaning you have to have a certain amount of hours before the next day so if you have any night shoots that you have coming up they're always at the end of the week because uh, you have you can't do a night shoot at the beginning of the week and then try to expect people to get up in the morning after that. So, long story short, Monday morning is always at the end of a you know obviously at the end of a good, good weekend and you have to get up early. And every Sunday night, man, all of us say the same thing: we cannot fall asleep. You know, we're stressed about it. Uh, and then when we do fall asleep, you wake up every hour. It's just brutal. And I have not figured out the life hack other than I know that the the, the Keon uh, pills or Keon again I forget the pronunciation, but those pills that I got from, from you, those do help me fall asleep. They just, I just wake up four and a half hours in, but at least I got that deep sleep where your, 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 your dreams are like telling brand new stories. that could be their own movies. Yeah, exactly. I've, I haven't found anything to get over it, but again, besides something like the key on sleep plus the non-sleep deep rest protocol. Now, how about when you, when you are up, are you into any particular like nootropics or smart drugs or wakefulness promoting agents? Not really. I think, I mean, I, I probably could look into that and deep dive a little bit more. Um, I think I feel like I'm already obsessive enough as it is on some of my other things. I'm like, if I try to look into one more thing, I'll go down another rabbit hole. But I, I find that uh, I haven't needed that. I mean, I 
I'm not even a big coffee person. Um, you know, I drink some coffee every now and then and some green tea just for health benefits. Uh, but I, I don't find that it gives me any more of a boost or wakefulness than fat, you know, intermittent fasting does mm-hmm. or, you know, the kind of the higher fat diet that I do, you know, low carb stuff. I'm now, because I'm now incorporating fruit more, I'm really looking into, you know, every other day now I have tons of fruit along with my my higher fat, high protein diet. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of experimenting with that a little bit. But I don't, I don't, I just don't have some of the, the crashes that most people do. My brain is always firing pretty well. So I just haven't felt the need to uh, to look into more of the stuff you're talking about. Now, I'm not saying it wouldn't help me, but I just haven't really needed it. All right. So whole body wellness is obviously a big part of my life. I'm always looking for new ways to make my body feel great, make my brain feel great. One non-negotiable for me is a daily dose of red light. I can use it to simulate sunlight. I can use it to simulate sunrise, sunset, right in my office, bringing the sun into my own office. The infrared light spectrum is fantastic for boosting cellular energy, for healing damaged cells that are under oxidative stress. There's a ton of clinically proven benefits to it. Better skin, higher testosterone, better blood flow to the whole body, pre-workout or post-workout for recovery. Use them in your office at night when you don't want to flip on all the bright lights, but you want that giant dose of soothing red light therapy. And what I go to is Juve for my red light. They source from the highest quality materials. They got medical grade components. They went through third-party testing. They have safety marks from nationally recognized testing laboratories. They give you the safest, most reliable product. It's unmatched. There's a lot of red light companies out there, but Juve is unmatched. They have a whole body treatment device. I can treat my whole body in 10 to 20 minutes. I do it once a day. They even have a little handheld device called the Juve Go. I can throw in my suitcase and take with me on the go. Barely weighs anything. And so I can do my red light when I'm in my hotel room anywhere in the world. This stuff just works. It travels through TSA too, also just fine. So juve.com slash Ben, J-O-O-V-V dot com slash Ben. Apply my code Ben to your qualifying order and you can feel what infrared's actually like in terms of a big upgrade in your health. J-O-O-V-V dot com forward slash Ben. And you're going to get an exclusive discount on your first order when you use my code Ben on your qualifying order. I'm pretty stoked because this is now something I can do and I'm on the go. And it's based on this idea that the human body being mostly water. But what you probably don't know is everything else in your body is 50% amino acids. That means basically water and amino acids are two of the most important things that you can have in your body. And some amino acids are essential. You have to get them from food, from breaking down steak and chicken and eggs and everything else. But this stuff called Keon Aminos is a plant-based full essential amino acids profile backed by over 20 years of clinical research with the highest quality ingredients, no fillers, no junk, rigorous quality testing, tastes amazing with all natural flavors. I got on the amino acids bandwagon way back when I was racing Ironman triathlon, started with branch chain amino acids, realized those were a waste of time, switched over to essential amino acids, and it has been a game changer ever since. Now, what did I mean when I said travel? Well, these Keon aminos, which are the essential amino acids that I take, they have for the watermelon flavor, the lemon lime flavor, the berry flavor, and uh, the mango flavor. They got stick packs now, so you can take them on the go anywhere. I I honestly have like a couple packs of my fanny pack now. I can dump them in water when I'm at a restaurant, have that instead of like a bread, a basket that comes out or a cocktail. They satiate the appetite. They accelerate recovery. They're amazing pre-workout or during a workout. The list goes on and on. Fact is, if you haven't tried essential amino acids, you're missing out. And you can save 20% now on any monthly deliveries and 10% on any one-time purchases if you go to getkeon.com slash Ben. That's getkion.com slash Ben to get my fundamental supplement for fitness. Keon Aminos, getkion.com slash Ben. There's obviously a lot of a lot of formulations out there. Probably, I, th- I think the the coolest company out there right now doing nootropic formulations is called uh, Nootopia. Uh, I, I interviewed the guy that is a formulator for that company, and you go online, and you fill out a, a questionnaire that identifies the unique neurotransmitters that you might need during any given day if you're short on sleep or you want a cognitive pick me up, and then they kind of customize a package and they send it to your house with these little formulations like brain flow and, and brain upgrade and, and uh, nectar and the, these little brain nutrients. And that, that company I think is doing a really good job. But then my latest find that I've been using for about the past four weeks, especially on sleep deprived days or travel days is this molecule that is, you, you can technically find it in coffee. Like coffee gets broken down into caffeine, 
which everybody knows, and then theobromine, which is the same feel-good euphoric component that you might find in chocolate or cacao. And then the last one that a lot of people don't know about is parazanthine. It's it's a spelled P-A-R-A-X-A-N-T-H-I-N-E. And there's this, uh, the, you know, the, the movie, I'm sure you, you probably heard of it or have seen it, Limitless with Bradley Cooper, uh, was inspired by this anti-narcoleptic agent called modafinil, or also known as Provigil, which will, you know, keep you awake for like 24 hours. I have it in my emergency travel stack if I, you know, fly overseas and get in at 2 a.m. and got to, you know, go speak on stage at 8 a.m. and then go through a full day at a conference. I'll actually take some of that modafinil, but the problem is it'll keep you up for 12, 16, sometimes 24 hours. This parazanthine stuff gives you the same, like, hyper focus, kind of like feel good euphoric effect, but only lasts about four to six hours. And so that's, that's the one that I'm using now if I am sleep deprived or if I, if I just got to like hammer through a morning, but I don't want to stay up later on that night. Sounds like you don't even need something like that. But I figure for, for people listening in and want to look into something like that, it's, it's uh, it, there, there's not a lot of, of companies that sell it right now. Cause I think it's kind of new, but it's called parazanthine. So it's an interesting one to look out into if, if people are sleep deprived and, and want to try it. Yeah. What have you found for focus? Because that's, I would say my, my bigger issue is not alertness. It's, it's yeah. focus. When I'm re- sitting down to write, my desire to browse, to check scores, to, to, I mean, I'm just so easily distracted. And unless I become a cannabis addict or something to, which, because I know that, that that can help with focus, but I'm trying to avoid, you know, <laughs> being dependent yeah. on that kind of stuff. I, know, I think cannabis kind of makes, makes you a little loopy. It's not that great for testosterone too, with, with long-term use, it kind of impairs yeah. testosterone exactly. and, and fertility. But the, um, yeah, for the focus in the, in the past, there's, there's been two things I've used. One is, uh, is caffeine, like a, like a cup of coffee, but you add L-theanine to it and L-theanine kind of elongates the effects of coffee, but produces a little bit more alpha brain waves. Uh, and so you get less of the jitteriness from the coffee, but it kind of gives you this long, slow bleed of focus. You, what you do is like a typical cup of coffee, you add a hundred milligrams of L-theanine powder, or you take like a hundred milligram L-theanine capsule at the same time that you have your coffee. So that and, or uh, microdosing with psychedelics, uh, particularly psilocybin or uh, LSD, the, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of heftier doses of those for, for other reasons. I just think they're, they're overused and abused, but very, very slight, small doses of either of those two can be really good for enhancing simultaneously focus and creativity. Of course, the problem is they're, yeah. they're illegal. They're difficult to get, um, they're you know, difficult to source, you know, and the quality varies widely, but you know, up, up until a few weeks ago, again, I would have done caffeine plus L-theanine or a microdose of psilocybin or LSD. Uh, but now I've been using that, that parazanthine thing. And I, I think it works even better, particularly for focus. So that's, that's kind of like my new one that, that I like, and it doesn't seem to have a, uh, a waning effect. It, it actually seems to work better the more frequently that I use it, almost as though the body has, has learned how to, how to handle that molecule effectively. So those are probably the top three would be uh, microdosing or uh, caffeine plus L-theanine or parazanthine. It's kind of like the top three for focus. Yeah. I'm going to look into that. Yeah. You mentioned the, the microdosing. I, I, my first thought was, is that, is that legal? Cause I don't, I, I know that, I mean, I'm in Texas. I know it's, it's not yeah. legal here, but I've been looking into that just uh, psychedelics in general, just cause I think that there's a, some extraordinary, progress being made in that field. But uh, yeah, the theanine I, di- I have tried, there's a, uh, I don't know if you know this, a fitness influencer, and I'm sure you may disagree with him on things, but uh, there's Kino Body, which is a guy named Greg Gogallagher. Oh yeah, I've heard he of him. Pro- yeah. Yeah. And he has a product called Kino Octane, which has uh, been really, really good. In fact, I drink that sometimes instead of coffee. And my wife now is, is, is really into it. Kino Octane really has has been a big benefit. And I've noticed my focus and mood change. I don't usually try to do things at night just because I don't want to stay up till, you know, eight in the morning, but, yeah. but, uh, I'm, I might actually start thinking, look, if I'm going to be writing from 11 to four at night, I might as well take maybe some of that at, you know, nine 30 or so. Yeah. It looks like I just pulled up the label. It's got, it's got caffeine and L-theanine. So basically exactly what I just described, which yeah. is great. It's probably why you noticed that effect, but then it's got ginseng, biotin which is really interesting that that's biotin is super cool too just because a lot of guys who are deficient in biotin they they, they take it and they notice a bump up in uh, in testosterone and thiamine b vitamin and l citrulline for the blood flow yeah that that's pretty well formulated i like that kino octane huh 
Yeah, K-I-N-O uh, octane really has been a big help. And my again, my wife, who's very different from me, and she does get up early in the morning uh, because she has to with the kids for school, and she's often tired. And she felt she said she said her writing mm-hmm. and her mood is better from keto octane than it, than it was from coffee. So that's been a, a big help. Yeah, yeah. And you always want to look for like sucralose and artificial sweeteners, but it looks like they sweeten this one with stevia. So yeah, it looks pretty solid. Yep. And uh, the only thing I'd be curious what you think of this is he says. Well, what I do uh, is keno octane first, and then he'll do like coffee a few hours later. And he says that the coffee before the workout kind of hypercharges the theanine you took, you know, a couple hours earlier. Yeah, um, it almost becomes like a like an additional boost. He goes, they 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 make each other stronger. Yeah, I guess it would depend because it looks like they already have caffeine and hydrous in the compound. But if somebody's a fast caffeine metabolizer, which a lot of people are then redosing with the caffeine could could give it a little bit of an extra effect pre-workout. So yeah, that's that's solid. I like that formula. Um you know this, this whole transition that you're doing from from keto into carnivore. Tell me about that. What inspired that move? Well, I've been doing keto for about 5 years. Uh, worked great for me uh, overall and uh, then I saw online um I I've, I finished filming and I while I was filming I uh, I realized I was you know, for, 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 I know on your podcast, we can talk about these kinds of things. My wife will roll her eyes, but gassiness. So I was really, really like gassy for years. I mean, I was known among my friends as like, just the, like if I fart, stay away, it's absolutely brutal. Right. Yeah. And I, when I switched to keto, uh, that all went away. And right. My wife just can lost always all the fermentable it, carbohydrates. Right. And she would say, I can tell when you cheated because, <laughs> uh, you know, I, th- that day would be, uh, farting. And it, the biggest thing for me seemed to be carbs with dairy. That was like the, mm-hmm. like, you know, a bowl of cereal with milk oh, yeah. is like just Titanic, you know? So, uh, keto, I, I was uh, like, I can tell like bloating and gas were the things that were the markers for me as what, what was healthy. And, uh, for a few weeks, I found myself. I'm like, man, I'm gassy again. Like, what is it? What am I eating that, in addition to my 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 normal keto diet, you know, I couldn't couldn't quite figure it out. And I, I decided I was going to really figure it out. And plus, my daughter has a lot of health issues, so I was I, I wanted to try to find something optimal for her. So I was like, I'm going to eliminate, and I'm going to I'm going to do. The, I don't know if you've heard of this, the BBBE challenge. You know, 30 days of just bacon, butter, beef, and eggs. No, I haven't heard of bacon, butter beef and eggs for 30 days yeah just nothing but that and then of course you can drink i mean like water and and salt and you know stuff like that but yeah so dr ken barry is kind of a popular carnivore-ish uh keto-ish guy on on youtube but anyway he, so he said 30 days and just see how you feel and so i did that not because I'm, i i want to do that for the rest of my life but because then i wanted to after a month introduce fruits and see what that would do and then and then eventually introduce some dairy and see what that would do and I was in, starting to get intrigued by some of Paul Saladino's stuff. I don't agree with him on everything, um, but I was intrigued by the idea of at least for 30 days, just eliminating everything else and seeing how I feel. So I did beef, butter, bacon, eggs um, for 30 days and felt fantastic. And I lost 10 pounds. I don't know that I needed to lose 10 pounds, but I did. Felt great. No gas whatsoever. And then I introduced uh, fruit. So now I'm doing every other day. That's why I guess I'm a form of carb cycling, basically, which is every other day I'm having lots of fruit and it's on my lifting day. So for today, see, normally I intermittent fast too. I won't take too much time on that, but I, I've been intermittent fasting every day for, for years, you know, 16 to 20 hours. And there's some new research that indicates that maybe not doing that every day is better that, you know, doing it maybe once or twice a week, um, right. you know, just to, because your body gets so used to the intermittent fasting that it ceases to be as effective. So I'm, and I'm such an extreme person. Like I really need the discipline of a routine, meaning like an eating routine or a fasting routine um, because I'm such a food addict. My, I mean, my dad was, my dad and both my brothers have each hit 400 pounds in their lives at one point or another. Oh, wow. uh, super obese family. And I've, I've been desperate to avoid that, but I have the same food addictions and, and cravings and stuff that they do. I just am more vain. <laughs> so I've never let myself get that heavy. But I need those kinds of rules to keep me from, you know, completely binging on you know, cookies for three hours. So all that to say, I'm trying to shift gears a little bit. And so today, for example, just to not take too much time on this, but for today, I didn't intermittent fast. I woke up and I, I had, a, had a drink with my concoction and then I ate bacon and eggs. 
And then I had a big fruit smoothie during my workout. I've also seen recent research that intra workout mm -hmm. carbs can sometimes be be helpful. So I mean, I've been so anti carb for so long, um, but Paul Saladino saying saying that he did it for two years and then had some issues, and you know started to see the benefits of carbs, but carbs through fruit. And uh, so that's what I'm trying right now. So I had a fruit smoothie during my workout, like I kind of spread it out through the 45 minutes of lifting. And uh, and then I'm going to have, you know, three full meals today and I'm going to eat a lot. I'm going to have a lot of calories, a lot of fat, a lot of protein and the, and fruit. And then tomorrow I'll probably intermittent fast and have two meals and they'll both be primarily focused on fat and protein and no, no carbs. So I'm just trying that out yeah. uh, and seeing, you know, and I feel pretty good. I just, I just started to think like, is it good? And I think Paul Saladino says this, and, I, and again, I don't agree with everything he says, but it just seemed like for the rest of my life, I don't know how how important this whole ketosis thing is. And I started seeing some research that long term ketosis isn't necessarily ideal. So I'm just trying, I'm just trying it right now, and I'm feeling I'm feeling good. The fruit, plus I love fruit, and I'm experimenting with reducing or eliminating vegetables because I've been hearing some of that. So I'm just trying different things to see how I feel. Yeah, I mean, for management of of like type two diabetes or epileptic seizures or something like that, long term ketosis can be a good medical management strategy. But I mean, the, the long term carbohydrate deprivation it has an impact on testosterone levels the proteoglycans in, in the joints, uh, the thyroid. So yeah, I, I think the idea of carb cycling or or cyclic ketosis as it's called is is a much more sound and I think more ancestrally appropriate strategy. I, I personally kind of hack that by not consuming any carbohydrates or, or barely any carbohydrates at all until the evening, at which point, because that's a more a widely varied meal, even from a social standpoint, you know, when my wife makes sourdough bread or we have a dinner party and, you know, somebody brings over some casserole with carbs in it or we're having red wine or a little bit of ice cream after dinner or whatever, that that's when I'll have anywhere from 100 to 200 grams of carbohydrates, which is great too, because it's a precursor for serotonin. So you boost a little more melatonin, you sleep better at night and you sock away some glycogen in the tank for the next morning's workout. And that, that tends to work pretty well compared to, you know, the same thing I experienced with strict ketosis back in the day, you just you eventually reach a wall the workouts aren't quite as good testosterone suffers thyroid suffers etc now what, what's interesting is that i i used to have the same deal with with the gas and i, did, I at the time i didn't understand fermentable carbohydrates but i was doing like you know big green smoothies in the morning and so all that prebiotic fiber was making me gassy and then uh I, my wife called it my microwaved oatmeal cookie i would literally get up make a giant thing of oatmeal put a couple of scoops of whey protein in there you know some sweeteners a little bit of almond butter or peanut butter microwave it for two minutes until it was almost like a souffle i'd eat that and of course within two hours was peeling paint off the walls with the gas and this was way back in the day before i understood much about you know how gas and bloating occurs was in addition to the whey protein and the oatmeal issue and then the giant green smoothies both of which i thought were were healthy you know this was back in the day where you know i would read recipes in men's health magazine which is anything but healthy and, and kind of replicate those where i was doing a lot of fodmaps right that this whole idea of fermentable carbohydrates uh, the fodmaps is is uh what is it? oligosaccharides disaccharides monosaccharides and polyols and that would be people who have gas who think they're eating healthy again but this would be like dried fruit, dried mangoes, big stone fruits like apples and pears and peaches, onions and garlic and apples are three biggies. And then, you know, anybody who kind of got back in the day when Tim Ferriss made it popular, the whole slow carb idea of beans and lentils. So many people, when they just get rid of FODMAPs, not only get rid of pretty much all gas and bloating, but irritable bowel issues, irritable bowel syndrome just goes out the window. They've even done studies that have shown that people who thought that a gluten-free diet is what fixed their gut, turns out that wasn't it. It was just the idea that at the same time, they eliminated a lot of gluten-containing foods, including wheat, which is a FODMAP. They were also eliminating a lot of the a lot of the carbs, a lot of the dried fruits, and a lot of the things that that cause the gas. So, like that that low FODMAP diet or a, or a low fermentation diet is a game changer as far as the gas and bloating goes, because a lot of times you don't have to like go into ketosis or go strict carnivore to get rid of gas. Uh, you just need to eliminate the carbohydrates that are fermentable. And once you eliminate those, but you, you can keep eating the carbs that are not fermentable, uh, you know, like let's say rice, blueberries, a little bit of honey here and there, you know, some of the smaller fruits, things like that, you can be just fine. So the FODMAPs are a big one when it comes to that issue. 
Yeah, that's been big. Yeah, I used to do the big oatmeal too. I would do, and I would pound on to the oatmeal all these healthy things because I'm like, well, I don't really care about the taste as much. So let me just get yeah. in, get everything I can. Oh my gosh, like you said, just brutal. I, there are certain things I still can't do. You know, be, like you said, beans and lentils. Like no matter what, uh, th- those those wreck me. Um, even though I, so many people say they're they're really healthy, I think for me it's just not not great. Um, but I'm finding that again, it's a lot of times it's the combination. So I can have dairy. Like I thought I was lactose intolerant. I might be still. I don't know. But I, when I when I'm doing no carbs with dairy, like if I, I can have some health, some good aged cheeses, um, and and have no problem whatsoever, and occasionally even have a little bit of milk, like whole milk. I don't do skim milk or anything, but whole milk, you know, in in smaller quantities. My problem is I do everything huge. I mean, I I have huge. I'm just such a <laughs> mm-hmm. an eater that uh, you know sometimes it's just a matter of no you can have some milk just a pound three glasses yeah. it's like it's like my morning smoothie I accidentally get it up to 1600 calories some days just because everything's got to go in the blender exactly you're thinking hey I might as well keep pouring this in so my smoothies now a little smaller um, I'm, you know and 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 I'm I'm leaving out yeah whey protein killed me I used to I was having whey protein every day for years heard how great it was healthy it was it may be for some people but for me. It's awful, and uh, and I didn't know it. I thought it was great, so I'm just having different different proteins now. And my my daughter, she because she was having so many issues with IBS and whatnot, did a, a st- you know kind of one of those food allergy uh, profile things, and whey showed up you know at the top of things oh, to yeah. avoid. Yeah, and I thought, well, oh, maybe that's uh, probably true for me too. Yeah, it kind of depends on the food allergy test. Like, like a lot of them are testing uh, just the IgG sensitivity, and you get this huge laundry list of false positives that are typically a, a so-called allergic reaction to a food. That's simply antibody reactions to a food that you eat regularly, anyways, like like eggs or or beef or something like that. Like people will test and they'll be like, oh, "I've been eating omelets for years," and it turns out I'm allergic to them. When in fact, you're just producing antibodies to a food because you're consuming a lot of it. The the trick is to get an IgG and IgE test. There's one company called Cyrex, C Y R E X, and they that's what I have all my clients do for food allergy testing because it it it'll tell you the foods you're actually allergic to, and then it it tests the white blood cell reaction to both the raw and the cooked version of a protein, which a lot of companies don't do. They'll just test the white blood cell reaction to raw proteins in the human body in general in response to like raw eggs, raw beef, raw chicken, et cetera, is going to mount a more significant antibody response to those foods. And so the, this Cyrex panel just basically gives you a more precise list of the foods that you should actually avoid. And I have a lot of people do this like an IgG test and be allergic to everything. And then they'll do the actual accurate test for IgG and IgE. And it turns out that there's not that much or at least less than they thought that they were allergic to that they're they're actually allergic to. So that one's called a, a, a Cyrex panel. I think that's that's pretty solid for, for food allergy. That's really helpful because, uh, yeah, my, my daughter, we, we were a little confused. Now, what about when you, because you talked specifically about eggs, because that is something that the, the, the consultant that we were talking to was like, well, you, you know, you just eat, if you eat something too often, then you can develop a problem with it. Are you saying that you actually don't have a problem with it? Or are you saying, no, you should, isn't the, yeah. the issue is you're allergic to it is that you shouldn't eat it quite so right. much. It, it, it's no problem at all. It just means that your body is producing antibodies as a reaction to that food just because it's, it's, it's built up the ability to be able to handle it normally. And so, no, it's, it's not an issue. Like if you test, if you take an IgG food sensitivity test in terms of like eggs and whey protein are an issue, I would do an IgG plus IgE instead. And, uh, and that would, that would be something like the Cyrex panel. So she could have eggs. Yeah, she could. Yeah. As often as possible. I mean, it doesn't matter. Well, I mean, any anything in, in moderation, she probably want to do the whole, you know, Rocky slamming, you know, six raw eggs in a smoothie every day. But yeah, I, th- I think eggs within reason are just fine. And most people who think they're allergic to eggs aren't actually allergic to eggs. If you were to do an IgG, IgE sensitivity test and something like a Cyrex panel and still shows that you're allergic to eggs, that's when I would consider avoiding them. But if it's just like a standard IgG panel, I don't think that's enough to, to actually avoid I do have to ask you though, when you were doing the the bacon, butter, beef, and eggs protocol, which I'm sure would have given anybody at the American Heart Association an, an actual heart attack just hearing about it. Did you do a blood panel at all and, and look at your your lipids, your triglycerides, or anything like that? Yes, and uh, I, yeah, I have, I have very high cholesterol. But what I I mean, everything that I've read, and I don't, I actually don't know where you stand on this, but uh, my triglycerides are awesome. My inflammation is awesome. It's just my uh, my LDL is yeah. hot. And yeah. uh, everything that I'm reading is that that's 
not an issue and that that's common for, for that kind of a diet and that that's not a problem. Yeah. I mean, unless it's through the roof because you have familial hypercholesteremia or something like that, I think decent levels of LDL, like mine are typically between like 200 and 230, which flags as high, but because it's so critical for things like cell membranes and, and precursing to hormones, I think that if your blood glucose is under control, your inflammation is under control, your triglyceride to HDL ratio is good, and your apple B count is within reason that all the things that would cause that LDL to be atherosclerotic becomes a, a non-issue. So, so yeah, I think it's better to pay attention to all the things around the cholesterol. And if those are elevated, then you tackle blood glucose, tackle inflammation, you, know, you tackle your vegetable oil consumption, things like that. But I think just myopically going after LDL really isn't that that useful. So like a lot of people would do like that bacon, beef, uh, butter and eggs protocol, but maybe they're, you know, whatever doing like the dirty Atkins approach where you're eating out a lot and getting exposed to a lot of vegetable oils and the chickens that are, you know, making the eggs that you're consuming are getting fed a lot of omega six rich grains. And the, the beef isn't from a great source with the hormones and antibiotics and things like that. I think that's where you would develop an issue, but I mean, like grass fed, grass finished beef and some grass fed butter and eggs from pastured hens and, you know, things along those lines. I, I don't see any issue with that. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I was, I was eating pretty clean. Uh, and when I would go to a restaurant, instead of the burgers, I'd get, I, I would get the, the good steak, you know, in Texas, it's easy to get really good steak. My cholesterol for sure. My LDLs were, were, got, got higher than normal. I mean, I've always been high, but this went really high. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm, I'm starting to round the edges off just a little bit, uh, cause uh, I don't want to go so crazy, but, but, but yeah, my triglycerides and, and inflammation were just like pristine, like yeah. lower than the, the low marker. So I feel, and I feel fantastic. I mean, 47 years old skin joints. I mean, I have no pain, no inflammation or anything like that. I, I don't think I'm going ever going to go full carnivore, but it was good for me to kind of eliminate everything else and figure out as I brought back in fruit going, okay, it looks like I'm responding pretty well to fruit. Yeah. And this good thing. I'm still back and forth. I'm curious where you stand on vegetables because uh, some of the things that I'm hearing that are against vegetables are compelling, but yet I know that 95% of the medical community and science community thinks vegetables are the greatest. Well, it, it, it's the idea of the fact that, that, yeah, they are rich in micronutrients and flavanols and polyphenols, but they have all these built-in plant defense mechanisms in them that may do a number on the gut, like lectins and glutens and phytic acids and mineral inhibitors and things like that. And, and even a, a high amount of raw roughage fiber can contribute to, to gastric inflammation or, or diverticulitis or things along those lines. But the, the fact is, I mean, and, and I've said this before on the podcast, just don't be an idiot about the food that you eat. Like you, if you were doing carnivore, you wouldn't just like jump out of a tree with a knife in your teeth, like a pirate and, you know, try to wrestle a deer to the ground and eat the meat raw. No, you'd have to like, you know, shoot it ethically, you know, in the vitals, process it, you know, smoke it, sous vide it, cook it, you know, and, and basically render that meat digestible. And it's the same with plants. Like, yeah, you're supposed to, to rinse and soak quinoa for 12 hours before you eat it. And you're supposed to, to ferment and soak and sprout seeds and nuts and, you know, and, and do a, a sourdough bread to deactivate a lot of the, the, uh, the, the phytates in wheat and, and lower the gluten content and, and pre-digest some of the carbohydrates. And, you know, this whole idea of slow food prep, especially when it comes to plant matter is something that renders the plants digestible and less harmful. We yeah, have the average person doing giant kale smoothies and eating the, the standard non-fermented wheat bread and, you know, not cooking their quinoa correctly and not sprouting their seeds and nuts. Yeah, that person could technically feel better just going carnivore because they're not taking the time to actually render vegetables digestible. But, you know, I, I think it, it comes down to more smart eating and actually making sure that that you that you make vegetables digestible. So, like, I don't do the big raw kale smoothies and, and giant ass salads for lunch anymore, but I still do a lot of, of pureed and steamed and blended vegetables, uh, vegetables that are low in oxalates. You know, I'll, I'll do a lot of uh, like underground storage organs like pumpkins and parsnips and carrots and, and beets, and sweet potatoes, yams, purple potatoes, things like that as carbohydrate sources. And if I do seeds and nuts, in many cases, they are soaked or they're sprouted. You know, when I do vegetables, a lot of times I am doing sprouting in jars or using these, these countertop sprouters or, or in some way rendering the vegetables digestible. And yeah, when I'm out at a steakhouse, I'll occasionally just order, you know, standard salad off the menu or whatever. But this idea of thinking about whether or not the vegetables that you're eating have been treated properly is a good way to go. But, but, you know, don't get me wrong. You could do 
strict nose to tail carnivore and be healthy your entire life in most situations. But the fact that it's so societally restrictive and the fact that God covered this planet with so many amazing foods that you could eat if you weren't a dummy about it dictates to me that it's it's just more fun to be an omnivore, in my opinion. That's really good. That's really helpful. Yeah, I I, I found that doing smoothies actually helped me a little bit. I, I used to just eat a huge salad and I would feel I wouldn't feel great. I'm like, why is that? This is the healthiest food out there. And then when I when I started eating it uh, as a smoothie, where I just take spinach and uh, put a little apple cider vinegar in it, put a little cinnamon in it, put a, kind of put all my even some some healthy oils into it. I didn't have the same bloating and issues that I used to have. The other thing was, and this is, I think, still a good practice, is that if you do eat vegetables, to maybe not have a bunch of vegetables with your main course unless you're at someone's house. Because I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd heard this. Uh, it was Dr. Berg, who, again, I'm not saying I agree with him on everything, but he was saying, do you ever feel bloated uh, you know, after a healthy meal? And I'm like, yes, yes. So sometimes it's because you're trying to eat the chicken, the the sweet potato, and the vegetables all at once, and your body's trying to digest all these different types of food sources at once. So maybe consider just eating the vegetables separately, you know, maybe thirty minutes yep. or sixty minutes, and that made a big difference for me. So right now I'm not eating vegetables just because I'm 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 practicing I'm trying trying something new and experimenting a little bit. But I have found that when I was eating vegetables, I got helped a lot by uh, separating them from my main course uh, time wise, and then uh, blending them instead of trying to you know, have these huge, big, leafy green vegetables on a plate it just didn't process as well. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and the obvious hack, although a lot of people use activated charcoal or something like this. And even though I'm not a big fan of a lot of pharmaceuticals or OTCs is the, uh, the, and I use this a lot when I'm on a plane because stuff expands in your stomach when you're on a plane. If you do want to have a meal, yeah, I mean, anybody who's, who's been on a plane had a meal, you know, you can get bloating and pressure and, and gas is these, uh, simethicone tablets. Those things work like gangbusters for relieving bloating almost instantly. And I mean, th- that's just the, the standard stuff you buy at Walgreens or CVS or on Amazon. Amazon, like if I'm at a, at a party or a dinner and I'm, I just know I'm going to have vegetables and fermentable foods and FODMAPs, I always have a little packet of that in my fanny pack and they're, they're just, it's just standard symethicone and it, it, there's nothing like, like that to just sop up gas, you know, and keep you from any type of embarrassing situations. If you are going to go outside your diet, so it's a good, good hack for people who don't want to, uh, to peel the paint, so to speak. I got to ask you one other question that might be related to FODMAPs. Cause every time I go to the Mediterranean or to Dubai, Dubai or Israel, you're eating hummus and, you know, tahina and, and, you know, and lentils and beans and yogurts and just about everything that would cause gas and bloating and discomfort. Yet it's such great cuisine. Uh, do, do you actually, or, or have you in, in doing the, the chosen traveled to, to Israel or Galilee or Jerusalem or, or places where, where Jesus visited? And it's kind of a selfish question, honestly, because I'm, I'm really wanting to go back there after, after not having been for a few years, because I used to, uh, well, I think the Israeli chamber of commerce used to think I was a Jew because my name is Benjamin Greenfield. And so they would, they would sign me up for these like blogging tours of spas and, you know, foodie locations and health clubs and gyms. It was fantastic. I went there a few times, did a lot of writing, but I never did like a Holy land tour, you know, like Jerusalem and, and some of the places where Jesus and the disciples visited. So I'm curious, a, have you spent much time in Israel and B, do you change your diet up much when you, when you go to a place like that? So I have been to Israel, yes. I uh, did it a couple of years ago uh, just in preparation for the show, and I'll be going again. Uh, it's extraordinary, and I had a very powerful powerful experience there with God, and, and it just, for sure, as, as someone whose life is dedicated to Jesus and my show is about Jesus now, as you mentioned in the intro, you don't have to be a believer that Jesus was the Son of God to still appreciate the show or appreciate the stories of Christ, but, uh, but going to, to Israel and seeing the history of it, especially when I'm making a show that is currently considered to be kind of the definitive portrayal, it's not only important, but very impactful. Uh, when I did go there, I did end up having kind of a gas fest because I was having so much of their um, uh, hummus. When I go to Greece or Middle East or whatever, and they have the best hummus in the world. Um, and so I think that, I, I think I just overate hummus because hummus has the beans and, or the- uh, Yeah, chick, chickpeas. Chickpeas, yeah, yeah, chickpeas, yeah, sorry. Uh, chickpeas, yeah. Uh, so I've, I've learned, you know, hummus in moderation is better for those around me uh, than than uh, just having a little bit, but it was, it was so good there. When I travel, I will say that's that's the hardest for me to maintain a diet, partially because of societal, just being with friends, you don't want to be the guy who's uh, refusing to, to enjoy 
something with everybody else, like a good, good health, you know, even if it's a mildly healthy pizza, you know, I just don't want to be that guy's like, no, no, sorry, I only eat meat. So uh, traveling for me is when, because I'm such a creature of habit when it comes to, to diet and exercise, that when I'm traveling, I'm not good at it. I'm not good at exercising. I try to get in steps. I, you know, I try, try not to binge too much, but yeah, when when I go to a country, especially, I'm like, I'm not going to be here and and only eat right. the food that yeah. I can get. You miss so out easily. a lot on the culture too. Exactly. I want to enjoy medit and Mediterranean diets are, are are great too. I mean, and you can have even if you're keto, you can enjoy a lot of the good things there. But yeah, I just I tend to be like I'm in a local culture. I want to I want to try their best thing. And I'm not going to go to Italy and avoid bread and pasta. I'm just yeah. it's just not going to happen. Um, yeah. So and what you find is too. Uh, you go to these other countries sometimes, like Italy, and the way they do their bread and their pasta is different than with the way we do it here. Less, less glyphosate. There, there's some, there's, there's some rumblings. I don't know if this is true about uh, the, the genetic modification of, of the wheat uh, having less concentrated gluten, et cetera. Maybe it's because you're less stressed when you travel, so you get a little more blood flow to the stomach if you're, if you're, you know, kind of like out of your daily work schedule. But either way, I agree. Like I, I, I can eat a lot more broadly expanded diet, especially from a carbohydrate standpoint when I'm traveling. And then there's also the idea that a lot of these travel hotspots, like, you know, near, near the equator, the body based on vitamin D production actually does a better job uh, processing without uh, high rises in blood glucose, things like, uh, you know, wheat, citrus fruits, et cetera. So I'll, I'll do a lot more, a lot more fruit, a lot more carbohydrates, a lot more potatoes, things like that when I'm traveling, especially to sunny climates and feel just fine with that type of protocol. And, uh, you know, and I'm kind of the same way Dallas with fitness and travel. My go-to is I, I walk everywhere. Like if, if I got to get anywhere, it's less than three miles. I walk there. And then my only metric when I travel is I have to do 20 to 30 minutes of something that's a little bit more difficult at some point during the day. And usually for me, that's like elastic bands or, or BFR bands or something like that in my hotel room. So I don't put myself under the pressure of having to go and hunt down a gym when I travel, which can be stressful and time consuming. But I tell myself, and, and I, I can do this, like even, even with a lot of decision-making fatigue and, you know, tiredness from travel or whatever, I know I can do 20 to 30 minutes of push ups, squats, lunges, et cetera, in my hotel room or in my Airbnb. And at that point, the only thing I tell myself is, all right, did that. Now all I got to do is just walk everywhere I go and I'll be fine. So, and I stay pretty fit when I travel just doing that. Yeah. I mean, and you're, you're better than I am, but I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on yeah, like this, like you just said, the stuff in your hotel room. Cause I, I just tend to be all or nothing. So I, yeah. when I travel, like, well, I'm not in my usual environment now and I'm going to just enjoy myself, but it's, I end up coming back, not feeling as good. And then I, when I have to gear back up into my workouts, it's, it's harder. So I'm like, I, I, there's nothing, like you just said, there's nothing, I have the time and it's not a huge, if, if anything, it helps me enjoy my time a bit more if I can just slip in 20 to 30 minutes of something. Uh, yeah. And I, like you, I do try to walk everywhere that, that, yeah. that makes a big yeah. Well, man, there's, 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 I feel like we could talk for hours uh, about, about all this stuff. But, uh, uh la last question I have for you is if people want to watch, uh, this show after hearing a little bit more about the man behind it, uh, the, the chosen, uh, are, are you guys still, I, I have to admit, like I, again, I watched the first season and a couple episodes of the second season with my sons, but are, are you still making episodes? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, uh, se season three, we recently finished filming. It, it launched in theaters uh, November 18th, and then it comes to streaming. The thing about watching The Chosen is uh, we're not uh, – I mean, season one is on a bunch of different platforms. So you can go find it on Amazon. Uh, you can find it on Netflix. You can find it on a bunch of places. But uh, season three is exclusive to The Chosen app. So if you just look up The Chosen wherever you get your apps, here's the cool thing about it. I'm not giving a big plug here, but – it's totally free and easy. So you don't have to subscribe to anything. You don't even have to give your email address if you don't want to. So if you're listening and you're going, well, I'm not a big Jesus guy, but I do like good television and I am intrigued by history. And obviously this is right now one of the, uh, and I say this with no arrogance, but it's one of the most popular shows in the world. It's been over a hundred million people have watched it. And uh, yet it's the most famous show no one's heard about because it's a, uh, because it's not on Netflix and because uh, it's a Jesus show. It's just not as on the radar in the mainstream as much. But if you're intrigued by the idea, by the idea, you just look up the chosen wherever you get your apps. And it's something that we could talk about some other time. But it's we've we've done something really interesting, which is just it's completely outside the system. You don't have to subscribe to anything. We make our own rules. We control all the content. We're, we're owned by nobody. And uh, our first season was crowdfunded. I mean, we we generated over ten million dollars. 
uh, from 19,000 people who invest season one, uh, shattering the all-time crowdfunding record based on a short film I did for my church, you know, four years ago. And uh, so it's it's a show that's that's at least demanding to be taken seriously. And if you're interested in it, it doesn't cost you anything. So you don't have to uh, go through a bunch of protocols or we're not going to try to sell you or convert you to Christianity or anything like that. Uh, it's just, it's easy to give, a, give it a try. So you just look up The Chosen uh, in your app store or on your TV apps or whatever, and we're uh, easy to find. Yeah, it, and it, it puts you in a good mood. Like, like it's just like, you know, the the humor and, you know, it's, it's not just like some kind of a, a Bible-thumping religious show. It's like that, what's one show that somebody mentioned to me I should watch that they said would just, uh, uh, Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso. And, and and I watched one episode, and again, I don't get into TV shows that much, but I watch it, and I'm like, oh, this this is, like, this, this is, has a good vibe to it. It's nice and positive and upbeat and humorous and doesn't have a bunch of violence and you know all the other rigmarole that, that you see in a lot of these these shows. So yeah, I'd, I really liked uh, all the episodes of The Chosen that I saw. And so I'll, I'll link to them uh, for anybody who wants to, uh, to go do your treadmill dumbbell death marches uh, while watching a decent show. Uh, th- this would be the one to check out. So I'll link to everything because obviously Dallas and I talk about a ton of little things. I know there's all sorts of little toys and things you want to look into. So I'll, I'll put together some really fantastic show notes for everybody listening in. And Dallas will send me his video, too, of his, his four moves for the low back. Uh, and I'll, I'll put all that at bengreenfieldlife.com slash Dallas. That's bengreenfieldlife.com slash D-A-L-L-A-S. Dallas, this has been super fun, man. I'm, I'm actually really glad we hopped on a call because I, I wasn't quite sure if a, if a film director would have that much to talk about in the realm of, of biohacking, fitness, and health, but uh, th- this was just a blast. Yeah, man, I really appreciate it, and uh, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't wait to listen to it because I'm, <laughs> I was googling and giving myself notes while you were mentioning a few things. But I'm like, I gotta, I gotta get these links as well because some of these things are really, yeah. really helpful. So yeah. I appreciate. That. Well, well, you got my number too, so you know you can text me anytime if you have you have questions about any of this stuff. And uh, and for everybody listening in, again, it's bengreenfieldlife.com slash Dallas. And I'm Ben Greenfield, along with the creator of The Chosen, Dallas Jenkins, signing out from bengreenfieldlife.com. Have an amazing week. All right, this is cool, but you want to pay attention because it's coming up right around the corner on Friday, December 2nd. You're going to get a chance to join me and some really powerful healing physicians down in Sarasota, Florida. This is a live event. It goes from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. I'll be there. My friend and the brilliant former podcast guest, the Dr. Strange of Medicine, Dr. John Lawrence is going to be there. HBOT USA, Dr. Jason and Melissa Saunas are going to be there with their hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Brian Richards of Sauna Space, Harry Paul, uh, one of John's friends who I recently met, who's also an amazing healer for an event that's super unique. It's all based around the elements, earth, fire, air, and water with a ton of treatments and technologies and modalities and very unique biohacks that you're going to get exposed to during the entire event. Basically, what I mean by that is when it comes to air, you're going to learn about hyperbaric oxygen and ozone and air filtration, everything you need to know to upgrade your air. When it comes to earth, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy, earthing, grounding, a host of other ways that you can use the power of the planet to enhance your health, your sleep, your recovery, your muscle gain, your fat loss, a lot more. More. Water, you'll learn about proper water filtration, how to upgrade your water, hydrogenated water, structured water, basically soup to nuts, everything you need to know about water and how to apply it in your home, in your office, in your life. And then finally, fire. This is a fun one. Lots of cryotherapy, a little bit of ice too, breath work, inner fire practices, a ton of stuff when it comes to introducing the element of fire into your life. So this event is super unique. John and I have been working on it behind the scenes and it has come together amazingly. There's even a VIP experience. If you sign up for the VIP experience, you could come two days early or stay a few days after the event. And basically, uh, you will get all the medical protocols customized by Dr. John and his staff if you claim one of those 10 VIP spots. That'll include like IV methylene blue, laser treatments, John's really unique bliss release, which is basically an endonasal adjustment, which is essentially like a chiropractic adjustment through your nose for your entire skull, which if you've had TBI or concussion or allergies or things like that in the past, it totally reboots that entire system. There's going to also be uh, ozone treatments, Myers 
IV cocktails, exosome treatments, IV laser, access to a CVAC machine, and John's entire facility is going to be at your beck and call if you got one of the VIP tickets. And then we're also probably going to have a little bit of a party later on in the evening after this event. The whole thing is going to be a pinch me. I'm dreaming full on cutting edge of biohacking experience. And I'm just now letting the world know about it. So spots are going to fill up pretty fast. Space is limited. But if you want to get in now, here's how. You go to bengreenfieldlife.com forward slash elements dash event. That's bengreenfieldlife.com forward slash elements dash event. It's in Sarasota, Florida. Again, it's all day Friday, December 2nd. I would come in early and stay after if you just want to try out all the crazy modalities there. You know, I don't know how fast those VIP tickets are going to sell out, but either way, this thing is going to be absolutely amazing. I just can't wait. Like I'm pinching myself. Can't wait to be on the plane to head down there and do this. So check it out. Ben Greenfield life forward slash elements dash event. And I'll see you there. I hope more than ever these days, people like you and me need a fresh, entertaining, well-informed and often outside the box approach to discovering the health and happiness and hope that we all crave. So I hope I've been able to do that for you on this episode today. And if you liked it, or if you love what I'm up to, then please leave me a review on your preferred podcast listening channel, wherever that might be. And just find the Ben Greenfield Life episode. Say something nice. Thanks so much. It means a lot.